is the Vintage RPG Podcast. Your source for the best in classic and contemporary RPGs. With your hosts, Hambone and Stu. Welcome to the Vintage RPG Podcast. Coming at you again from the clubhouse hidden somewhere in the swamps of New Jersey. I'm John Hambone McGuire, and with me, as always, is the founder and publisher of Unwinnable. Today, he says we're talking about Mainz, but I thought he'd want to talk about ducks. Stu Horvath. I'm always low key talking about ducks. Yeah, you are. <laughs> I uh, one time I, I was uh, we went on a walk into the, the wetlands park down down in Lynnhurst, and uh, I said to Jer that that I admire ducks, and he thought that that was the the funniest thing he's ever heard. And since then, he's decided that ducks are my favorite animal. So, oh, that's nice. Yeah. So you get a little presents and get you a little duck, and you're gonna be like, <laughs> "Thank you, buddy. I appreciate this." And meanwhile, you're like, "That's the wrong kind of duck, son." <laughs> yeah, no, it's it, it definitely anthropomorphic ducks with swords are really my jam. But he'll grow into it, hopefully. So, Stu, I think I pronounced the name right at the start of the episode. What are we talking about today? Uh, we're talking about Big Three, which stands for the Mainz Index to Glorantha. It's by Rick Mainz of Chaosium. I believe he's the president of Chaosium. Oh, nice. Yeah. We should have Rick on the show one of these days. Uh, Rick, we should have you on the show one of these days. <laughs> yeah. Have your people call my people. I am my people. <laughs> yeah, I'll, dro- I'll drop you an email. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I like the idea of just like this one-sided booking thing. It's just we're going to call out people and, and, and make them press gang them onto the show. I mean, we're presuming that they listen, and hopefully they do. But if not, you know, tell your friends. I know that Rick periodically listens. I've chatted with Rick a couple. I've had a couple uh, Zoom calls, which were super cool. In the last days of the the book production, I got like I got a little confused and 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 gun shy about some of the stuff involving Fritz Leiber and the deities and demigods kerfuffle between TSR and and Chaosium. And Rick was kind enough to have a, a Zoom, a video chat with me. And uh, he he showed me, he dug into the Chaosium archive and was showing me all sorts of stuff, handwritten notes of apology from Fritz Leiber about the whole situation and the, with Lankmar uh, being, uh, the rights to Lankmar being sold to both TSR and Chaosium and, and, and that whole thing as well. It was just, it was super cool. So... <laughs> Rick is, uh, I think, uniquely positioned to write something, uh, to put together a book like uh, Big Three, which is a guide to the publishing history of Glorantha. Oh, I love this book. It's so good. I think that this format book is super important to the hobby. I feel like there should be a book like this for every long standing game. The fact that there is not a handbook to D and D like this is astonishing to me. Um, having now uh, flipped through the the Glorantha one, if somebody would like to hire me to produce these for your game, I'm happy to 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 help. <laughs> yeah, I think it's been proven that you could write a big boy book. You know, <laughs> I think that the track record is there. This isn't even that big, um, but what it is is exhaustive. It looks at and provides cover art. Uh, for just about every mainline publication that has ever mentioned uh, Glorantha. So th- it starts with the, the early RuneQuest stuff. Of course, collects Rick's own Moon Publications books. Uh, it, it also has the 13th Age stuff and and uh, the Avalon Hill and, and Greg Stafford's like off-label Glorantha publications. And it doesn't just catalog the stuff that exists. It also catalogs a lot of the stuff that was planned and never manifested or canceled. Or uh, So the, you get glimpses of the alternate histories of things that might have been uh, but are not. And it's it's just it's fantastic. There's a lot of commentary sprinkled throughout about the decisions that were made in publishing these things and in creating these things and who was working on them and when and how they developed over time. If you like Glorantha... <laughs> It's a book that you really kind of need uh, on your shelf because there's just it's been around since 1978, 79. So like like there's just a, a wealth of history. Well, it actually predates that because Greg Stafford was creating Loretta in the 60s. There's just naturally a, a huge amount of information out there to kind of collect before it's lost, uh, especially with having with Greg having passed on and 
And the minutia of sort of the business side of it, the the publishing history, the ins and outs of that, of it being licensed somewhat to Avalon Hill in the 80s and what a disaster that was and how how uneven the production value of a lot of that stuff was, even if like Daughters of uh, what's the one? Is it Daughters of Darkness uh, is a, a, a late RuneQuest 3 product put out by Avalon Hill. And it's like one of the most hated. Everybody thinks it's terrible. And most people blame Avalon Hill for that. But it was actually produced by Chaosium. <laughs> uh, really? and it, yeah, and it was it was produced by Chaosium like, you know, way fast and they weren't happy with it. And it got it had to be put out because like they, they had requirements in their deal and, and fiscally that needed to, to be satisfied. So they put this subpar thing out. It, it's just because it's subpar. It's interesting to me that even me, I, I, I reflexively am like, wow, that's the Avalon Hill. And it's like, no, it was just that was how it happened with Chaosium. Sometimes you got to cut corners to make things happen the uh the eldorad product in the avalon hill line is also sort of like i don't own that one and i've sort of just like stuck my nose up at it instinctively because like, i'm just like Ugh, it just doesn't seem right and then i i was reading in here that it's like it's a weird copy of prax and uh the big rubble and uh pavis and they're like sort of like why did they do that instead of just doing a new iteration of pavis and the big rubble but they didn't. I feel a book like this explains as many mysteries as it uh, it, it conjures up new ones too, right? Like, and just on the level of, I think it's super important to get visual uh, representations of of these books all in one place. You get to see the weight of the visual history of of the property as well, and that's really hard to do because a. Uh, most people don't have all of the RuneQuest stuff. I don't even have all the RuneQuest stuff. I have my limits. I don't. I don't have the uh, a lot of the later edition stuff uh, between Avalon Hill and the modern Chaosium version. So it's cool to see all of that together. Be, that stuff takes up a lot of room, right? And also, right. if you're if you're collecting the old stuff, it, it can be expensive. Especially some of the he collects all the magazines, the the Reaching Moon magazine, Worms Tales. Uh, is the the Chaosium one Reaching Moon was a fan publication, which I think Rick might have founded uh, way back in the day. Anyway, to see all of that stuff collected in one place is 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 really important. I think that it's easy to lose the vibes that that really kind of conveys in role playing games. I think that that we we often forget how much uh, the experience is dependent upon uh, sort of subconsciously referencing the art that accompanies the games. That's part of the world building, the part of the imaginative play. And you can see that even with Dungeons and Dragons. Like there's that weird tension between uh, sort of the old school modes of uh, visual representation and the new newer school visuals. And it would be I think that it would be eye opening if you put all of the D&D stuff into one book, just the covers and like a little bit of like like notation about how. And when these things were published and, and and the process, just like the like big three, I think that it would change people's perception of the game considerably. I think it would change people's conception of uh, a lot of things, uh, fantasy art in general. And I just think that any game like RuneQuest that's been a lo- around for a long time, and that really kind of includes anything that came out in the 90s, like a White Wolf book like this would be fantastic. It would just it would just, it would it would teach you just flipping through it. It would teach you so much about the 90s like you would just take it in aesthetically through your eyeballs you would get a sense of of 90s history just by looking at uh the collected white wolf covers you know well also i think that there's a very specific thing that happens where you forget a lot of what came in between the hits right Mm -hmm. because when you mention you know runequest dungeons and dragons you mentioned call of cthulhu you mentioned any of those like there are people who can rattle off the top of their head all the ones that were hits, but you're often stuck with a thing where it's like, well, you forget how much the stuff that wasn't necessarily like failures or bombs, they just weren't hits. They weren't Ravenloft. How much that actually shapes the rest of the medium and really supports those hits that come out and kind of, you know, tee up the thing that is going to be the next big thing in that particular you know 
corner of the hobby, right? And, and that's why I think stuff like this is important. That's why I think your book's important because you flip through it and you're like, well, wait a second. This other stuff was here as well. And this was equally as awesome, but just maybe didn't have a high print run because it came towards the end. Maybe not a lot of people bought it. You know, little column A, little column B. Well, it's it's just like, it's like uh, I had to have Dragon Roar in that book because I needed... I. <laughs> I needed to make sure that I did my part that that the war hedgehog was part of the historical record of this hobby. Absolutely. <laughs> you know? like, and it's just it's like a silly game, but like th- this is an industry full of silly games. So it it and you're right. Yeah. It, it, one one of the great things about uh Bigs 3 is the index of all of the fan publications that uh are either dedicated to Glorantha lore, Rude Quest, the games or you even just had an article on it once. I'm sure that this is not complete. I'm sure there's stuff that was made by four people in, you know, Utah and no one really knows about it, but this feels at least fairly exhaustive. And that's hard work tracking down fanzine stuff like that. Those things sprang up, disappeared, moved around the country, you know, like like they were photocopied in a lot of instances. Like There's just there's a huge amount of material out there that was produced by a uh, sort of a distributed network of people, you know, all over the place. How do you track that? And, you know, Rick has tracked that over many years and has, has collected them. And he doesn't have covers of everything, but the text index of this stuff. I, as somebody who knows about this stuff, it was still uh, an eye opener that there is just that much fan made third party material out there. You know, I expected to have like a, a bunch of entries for the APAs like um, alarms and excursions. Right, right. But I didn't expect to have like so many like dedicated things from independent publishers. Like there's just there's so much. <laughs> like, yeah, seriously. Like, Havoc Tales and uh, Reaching Moon, we already mentioned. And all of this stuff is sort of representative of their own localized versions of Glorantha, which is cool because that that has become a tradition of Glorantha. I think almost uh, every uh, Chaosium book that I own and and the the Moon Publications book is that you're uh, opens with a, a note that says that while we're presenting this stuff as an authority, of what Glorantha is, your Glorantha may vary. You're welcome to change it or mix it up and have other, Greg Stafford called them uh, discoveries, uh, implying that he was uh, researching sort of a, a hidden mythology. But that's all it was. It was it was Greg kind of coming up with this stuff and deciding what was real and what wasn't. But that's important from a publishing perspective. But from, a, from the perspective of play, any Glorantha is a valid Glorantha. There you go. Studio, any final thoughts on this wonderfully exhaustive book of Glorantha knowledge? Man, go pick up a copy. Just like, ah, it's so good. It's so good. It feels very like a sibling to my book in a in a way. Like there's not the, the if you get rid of all the commentary, all that, all that tedious writing, it focuses so much on the, the, the covers and being just a reference book of the entirety of, uh, of a fantasy world's published history. It just it feels like it feels like you should put this right next to my book. I just I love that this exists. And we and I'm serious, like there should be more of these. Like we should all gather together and try and figure out how to how to get books like this into to existence, because uh, a lot of this stuff, uh, I, I feel like, is teetering on the brink of being lost. And that would be sad here here. So, hey, real quick, before we go home on this episode, I just want to say thank you so much to everyone who swung by to see me at Page, everyone who picked up some 3 to one action books, everyone who picked up a copy of Monsters, Aliens, and Holes in the Ground, Stu's book. It was great chatting with you. It was great meeting you, and I uh, had a good time down there. I just want to say what's up to uh, Ian McGarty over at Silver Belay, Tom Wilson over at Throwy Games, uh, Brian Shutter, the Neon Lord, uh, having a great time hanging out, holding it down at the con for three days during a storm. Uh, really stoked to do some hanging. Uh, real quick, Tom has a Kickstarter. It's going to be live uh, as this episode airs called The Slumbering City. Uh, it's designed for Shadow Dark. Second to fourth level adventure, four to six characters. Uh, it's going to be a good one. It looks kind of like old Conan, and, uh, and I'm here for it. But yeah, this is another amazing episode of the Vintage RPG Podcast. Do where can people find you on the internets? They can find me on Instagram at uh, Vintage RPG, and uh, I, I'm sure that Mig Three will wind up there eventually, someday. 
in the in the future. I do want to just say I, I didn't make it down to page uh, because I was sick and that's a bummer. I really wanted to thank uh, the listener who brought the Star Wars glass. Uh, that really made my my day. <laughs> I'm about bringing that over. Oh, yeah. The uh, the strep throat plague fairy swept over your house and it was yeah, it's, you know, all encompassing. Perfect timing, plague fairy. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> you, you have a small child. They are yeah. they are the uh, patient zero at, at generally every uh, every turn. Yeah. You can find me across the internet at John McGuire RPG. I'm mostly hanging out on Instagram these days. I'm not even going to try to front and be like, you can find me all over because I'm really not posting there. But on Instagram, I am posting my travels and my adventures. I'm actually going to be leaving the house a lot. I'm going to be doing some conventions. You can check me out. Next convention will be at TotalCon in Massachusetts where I'm going to have some action and uh, hanging out with the dudes, ready to give out some high fives and hellos to everyone who swings by the booth. I'll be ripping it with uh, Joey Royale and Brian Shutter, the Neon Lord. If you like the show, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. Your reviews really do help other listeners to find us. If you really like the show, why not become a patron? Patreon.com slash VintageRPG. We got a behind-the-scenes look at Stu's books and everything he's writing. We got a behind-the-scenes look at 3 to an action. At the $5 tier, you could jump in a monthly game with me. I'm not quite sure what the theme of January is going to be yet, but I will be posting it by the time this episode airs. Uh, it's always a good time. Uh, December, I ran Halls of the Blood King, which was superb. And at the $10 tier, Stu's got a game for West Marches, which you could also get on my games as well at the $10 tier. And for as little as a dollar a month, you can get early list episodes at some point on Friday or Saturday, depending on when we record them in the week, or if I'm an idiot and I went to a convention and didn't post it, uh, patreon.com slash vintage RPG. So for Stu Horvath, I'm John Hambone McGuire. May the dice always roll in your favor. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to like, review, and subscribe to the podcast. Every review helps other listeners to find us. The Vintage RPG Podcast is a ham-fisted production. Music by Dega West. Art by Schaefer Brown. If you like the podcast, you should also consider becoming a patron at patreon.com 